It is a lot easier to talk the walk than to walk the talk, isn't it? And it's hard in any area of our lives, but for those of us who are parents, we may not say it, and I have actually said it to my kids, half joking. But we have definitely thought, at one point or another, do as I say, not as I do. At times, I get frustrated. Yep, Pastor Ed gets frustrated, believe it or not. Uh, I get upset, I get impatient. I have even spoken harshly to my kids. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I know, I know. This is yeah, it's shocking, right? But I profess, I'm sorry, and at times, at times, the worst of all is speaking and acting in relation to my kids without grace. But I profess, I profess to my kids that I love God, and I'm a Christian, and I'm a Christ follower, and that what should come out of a Christ follower and a Christ following dad is grace. So then when I'm not full of grace towards my kids, I'm acting like a what? Hypocrite. I'm not necessarily a hypocrite, but I'm acting like one. And I'm sure that I'm not alone in the struggle. We're all <laughs> parents, and I know we're not all parents in here, but we're all a work in progress, amen? <laughs> and, um, living in line, like actually living in line in front of our kids is so important. What we teach our kids in words is important, but the way in which we live toward them is just paramount. Have you ever said something that was inappropriate and then your little one just repeats it, right? I wish I could think of an appropriate example, but most of them are inappropriate. But I do remember several years ago, we're watching football, as we do a lot in our house, and there's a beer commercial, which are, which are great, you know, beer commercials. And um, it was something along the lines of, you, you just got to have a Miller Lite. And Elijah's probably five at the time. I don't know, five to eight, somewhere in there. And says, Dad, I really want a Miller Lite. <laughs> no idea what he's saying, right? Now, none of us will ever be perfect parents. In fact, our homes should be the central place where our kids experience, not just hear about, but where they experience grace. It should be the central place where they experience being forgiven and, and this is the hard one, parents. Our home should be the central place where our children experience forgiving us. Not perfection, but progress. Now this is not about a parenting destination. It's a parenting direction. It's continually pointing our kids to grace. And I would love to present to you the high, high importance in your home of your kids experiencing forgiving you a lot because you need it as a parent. Amen? I mean, that doesn't get us too excited. Like, that's not a real exciting introduction to a sermon, but it is so important because we're talking about grace that sets us free. Now, the key this is the key for all of us, whether you're single or married. I know I'm talking about parenting, but whether you're single, married, kids, no kid, regardless of the season of life that you are in, nothing is more important. Nothing is more important for the Christian than living in line, actually our lives lining up with the gospel. And it's interesting, I hear a lot of, in the church planting world, pastors who are starting new churches, I hear a lot of this gospel, like one of the values being gospel-centered, and that is so important. And it's not, not one of our values because we don't want it to be at the center. But we just kind of almost take for granted that it should be at the center. But I've rarely heard this unpacked in a real tangible way. What does that mean? So I'm saying it's super important that we w live in line with the gospel, but what does that mean? I'm glad that you all asked, because this is what Galatians chapter 2 is all, about, is all about. This is one of the most important, tense, and dramatic scenes in all of the New Testament. And that's exciting. Like This is not a dry book with a bunch of rules written in it. 
This is an exciting book where there's conflict and resolution of conflict, which is a lot of our life, is it not? Two of the leading apostles of Jesus, Peter and Paul, get into this face-to-face, -face open conflict. Can you imagine the apostle Paul who wasn't with Jesus when he was walking on earth, but he was confronted with the risen Jesus face-to-face -face and then learned directly from him, and Peter, who sat at the feet of Jesus for three years, one of his closest friends, and here they are, neck and neck. In this chapter, we will see an example of how a true Christ follower failed to live in line with the gospel. And because of that, there's hope for me and there's hope for you. And then we see how another Christ follower confronted him. So Peter fails, Paul confronts him. And through this, we see how every Christian, how to live in line with the gospel. What does that mean? This scene has changed. We started with a church in Jerusalem. So we have this Jewish church, which we saw in the last few months through the book of, of Acts. And Galatians is kind of at the forefront of the book of Acts. So we see the shift now. The scene changes from the Jewish religious hub of Jerusalem to Antioch, which, then, which from then on becomes the model church. So I think we, we really fail when we say, oh, we want to go back to the first century church and we just look at Acts chapter 2. But really the model that we should be following is the church in Antioch, which was the first multi-ethnic church. So much of the story in the book of Galatians is important for us as we live out our life here in Gaithersburg in 2018. So let's listen to what God has to say to us through his word this morning. As we look in... Galatians chapter 2, and we see this confrontation between Paul and Peter. How a true Christ follower failed to live in line with the gospel. Picking up here in verse 11. When Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. So this is the Apostle Paul writing this letter to the churches in Galatia, explaining this scene. I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Pretty harsh. I mean, this is intense. For before, before certain men came from James, he, Peter, used to eat with the Gentiles. They were bros. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid. He was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray kind of set the scene. He, Paul says, before these men came from James, who were these men? These were like men who posed as apostolic delegates sent from the church in Jerusalem in which James was like the head apostle. So they were setting themselves up as if they were sent from James, preaching a false gospel that it wasn't just faith in Jesus, but it was faith in Jesus. And then you need to be circumcised. And this is the whole argument, if you're familiar with the book of Acts, chapter 15, they, they, they have what's called the Jerusalem Council. And in this council, they are dealing with this issue. Do we, Gentiles, need to be circumcised? Or the Jewish apostles are asking that question, well, sh do these Gentile Christians now need to be circumcised? And the answer, church, no. <laughs> right? So these are false apostles. Now, certainly Paul uh, or uh, Peter, rather, knew and understood this clearly. He was actually taught directly by Jesus. Jesus appeared to him multiple times in dreams and visions, in Acts 10 and Acts 11, making it clear that he could eat anything that he wanted and making it very clear that the gospel was for the Gentiles. And in verse 12, we see that it was actually his way of life. So it says, before these men from James came, man, we were hanging out. We were bros, man. We were, we were you know, coffee, coffee mates every day. However, because of fear, Peter fell out of line. Pressure from this small but influential group of false teachers, which said, salvation is Jesus plus something else. Salvation, this was the salvation through Jesus plus group. The same Peter remember, who denied that he knew Jesus at Jesus' trial, is now denying that he knows Jesus essentially here. And he's living in fear. 
Yeah, I mean, this was the great Apostle Peter who just before this preached and thousands of people came to know Jesus. This is so important, y'all. If Peter struggled like this, you think you're not going to struggle like this? Do you possibly think that you're not going to be tempted to deny Jesus and fall out of line in the way that you live your life? This is so important for us to grasp. The grace of Jesus is so important. And, you know, maybe not all of you are like Peter. I feel like I kind of, I'm like Peter in many ways. Like, I kind of put my foot in my mouth. I'm quick, you know, quick to, to judgment and, and, you know, kind of quick thinking, you know, and make decisions real, real quick and, and maybe uh, more easily swayed maybe than others. Some of you, your personality is just real steady. My personality is not steady. My personality is, you know, like this. And so we relate in different ways. But in, regardless of our personality, we need to lean in here with Peter. <laughs> the impact... He still believed the gospel. He didn't turn away and become a non-believer. He just wasn't living in line with it. Now, the impact of Peter's hypocrisy was huge and significant. A crowd followed him, and even Barnabas. Like, these aren't like the new baby Christians who are, you know, this is, these are like the leaders. These are the key people who were under the best teaching around the greatest leaders of all time. This is Barnabas who like, was hanging with Paul. <laughs> and even he was led astray. Now, I also believe that Peter was holding on to some racial pride. Although he ate with his Gentile brothers, he likely had some lingering angst against them. He may not have even been aware of it, right? He, he's hanging, he's like, the gospel set you free and all this. But there's something in him that was yet to be dealt with. Jesus, he didn't, he didn't allow the gospel to get deep enough in there. And he's holding on to this lingering angst. It was ingrained in Peter. I think most of us, and I don't know everybody's story, in different cultures and in different traditions and in different countries, this is ingrained in people in different ways. But depending on where people are coming from, it can be deeply ingrained. You know, think of someone who's growing up in a home where they see their father and their grandfather saying hateful, racist things against any particular race or ethnicity. That's deeply ingrained, and it's, it's not impossible, but it's hard to change. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, of course. And so this was ingrained in Peter and all Jews that Gentiles were less than full human beings and without dignity. Peter let cultural differences become more important than gospel unity. Do you think that Galatians is relevant for us today and that we ought to spend some time wrestling with it? See, the problem was not unique to Peter. This struggle can creep into our lives with greater ease than we probably like to admit. That's why Paul wrote this. Not for those people out there. He wrote this for the church. Peter basically succumbed to legalism, right? So what is, what is legalism? Legalism is looking to someone or something other than Jesus to be acceptable to God. Looking to something or someone other than Jesus to be, how can I be accepted uh, unto God? If I, just, if I just do this, then I'll be right with God. If I just uh, wear these kind of clothes, this is, this is the appropriate kind of attire for uh, someone who follows Jesus. This is the right music, and we shouldn't veer from that. I'm, I'm looking for something other than just Jesus so that I can be acceptable to God. And what legalism does is personally it leads us to pride on one hand, so I can accomplish it, so you know I'm, I'm proud of what I did, or fear because I'm not. Corporately, or when it comes to relationships with others, it leads to exclusion. So excluding those who aren't like me or whatever, or disunity. Exclusion and disunity. Legalism is the root of racism and classism and sexism and all these isms. So think with me for a minute about how this works out in the life of the church. So before we become a Christian, we have certain biases or isms. That's true for all of us in one way or another. We don't see all people the way that God sees all people, 
right? And depending on where we grow up or what we learn uh, growing up, how we grow up, different cultures and different types of things, we have different biases towards different types of people. And so we look down on certain people based on what they had or didn't have. It could be all within one ethnic group, but maybe there's people who don't have, they're poor, so the rich look down on the poor, the poor look down on the rich, or whatever it might be. I, there's infinite applications of this. People's backgrounds, where they're from, political views, right? Uh, 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 this is very much true in the church as well. It's alive and well. But let's say before we become a Christian, we're just gung-ho that every Republican or every Democrat's right, and yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then we become a Christian, and, and then, oh, we still have those biases, don't we? Yes. Personalities. Those struggles don't just vanish when we trust Jesus. It doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't have the power to break those chains. But it takes some work depending on where we're coming from and how deeply ingrained they are. We struggle to live in line with the gospel just like Peter struggled to live in line with the gospel. The benefit that he had was that he walked with Jesus. He saw how he treated the rich and the poor and everyone in between. He saw how he engaged the Syrophoenician woman and the woman at the well and the prostitute. And the woman who, who the, the prostitute who brings this perfume that could have made a difference and broke it on his feet and with her tears in her hair wipes his feet with it. And the disciples are like, whoa, man, whoa, we could solve problems with this. So we don't have that, but we read the stories. And so this is for, uh, let's learn everything that we can from this. So it might take us a little bit longer than it took Peter. For some of us, some of us get it quickly. So like my wife and I are a good example of this. She, man, she'll just get, you know, you know, like maybe like many women, okay? And, you know, maybe some of its personality though too. For me, man, I'm just hard-headed. I just got to, you know, I got to experience failure a lot. And that's all right. That's good. And by the way, side note on failure, if we don't embrace failure, we're not going to grow and change. So if you're like considering volunteering or being a part, maybe being a leader or uh, stepping into something here at Restoration Church, there is plenty of room to fail. Because, I mean, if, if, if I'm leading anything, <laughs> there's plenty of examples of failure. But we learn a lot through that, don't we? We tend to be uncomfortable with certain people, don't we? Or less comfortable, at least. And at times we respond like Peter. So we might politely sit among those other people. And I'm not, I am not applying this to you here, but I just want us to feel, I want us to feel something here. So we might politi poli uh, politely sit uh, with those other people like in a church service or, you know, something like that. Or even in a small group. But we often have a hard time developing close relationships and deeply loving people. Who are those other people? You know, those other people who they do things different. <laughs> and, you know, their way of family is maybe very different. And I, I like my things like this. And they, they like their things like this. And, and, and there's those, those people that like their yard like this. And then I like my lar yard like this. You know, and their neighbors who they park their cars, you know, like this. But I like to park my car like that. <laughs> Or whatever it is. In, in some homes, you know, the food that they're cooking smells a certain way. And in other homes, it smells a different way. Or in some homes, you, gotta, you, you take your shoes off. And, and there's a thing there. In other homes, it's different. And some have, you know, like a bunch of dogs running around, you know, or whatever it might be. And, and the reality is, it is hard to, to deeply love people who are very different. In fact, it's impossible <laughs> apart from the grace of God. Because what the grace of God sets us apart to do is to love people in a way that is not explainable. Like if we could just explain this, it wouldn't be supernatural. Like the fruit of the Spirit begins with love that I don't have in myself and I need God to fill me with. And so it's fairly easy for us to judge ourselves and each other based on the fruit of of love. Now that looks differently, but generally when there's a supernatural change in someone's life and they're leaning in with love, you can tell, right? The root of the problem is that we not we don't live in line with the gospel. Now, one last but very dangerous and subtle way that we fall out of line is when we simply take our preferences too seriously. 
And we, and we attach a moral significance to an amoral, amoral thing or issue. So, for example, worship styles. Well, maybe you like music that's a certain style. Or, you know, I mean, I, I felt like we were on the verge of tip, being a little more expressive this morning. We didn't quite get there, but I felt like we were on the verge. There, there was someone maybe that was wanting to yell out, you know, and, and amen, you know, or, or just clap. Or, and the, but something was holding you back. So there's different styles. Some of you like that a little bit more, and some of you don't. How you dress. And you might think, you know, you may have grown up in, a, in an ultra-conservative kind of place or, a, or, a, or not ultra-conservative place or whatever. Or how you're supposed to dress in church. We had this dear lady, I won't say her name, but she was in our church. And she was in our Chinese church, but she wasn't Chinese. And she was from another country. And she was special, man. She was so special. But she came from a tradition where it was black and white on things that are not black and white. Like how you're supposed to dress. Or, or how you treat somebody when it's their birthday. I remember that became a big deal. Like, I didn't treat her in the way that she felt like she should have been treated on her birthday, and I had no idea. I was like, hey, I'm just treating you how we do birthday in my house. I, I don't know how you do it at your house. Help me, <laughs> you know? And we've still become, we're still friends, so it's, it's all good. But we can, we can easily fall in, out of line, right? Culture. One of the things that I've, has just been such a, it's such a clear um, example for me that I've experienced on multiple occasions is the difference between the black church and the Asian church. Or, I've experienced more recently, the white Presbyterian church. There's similarities between the white Presbyterian church and how they act in worship in, in Chinese churches often. And so how do you think, what does the black church sound like during worship? I mean, I'm not trying to look toward our black folks, but, you know, what, anybody been in a black uh, church uh, service? Hey, hey, Come on! Yeah, and actually, it's funny. <laughs> I would love to hear more. Jewel was just in Africa, and uh, you had some experiences there where it was different, right? Like, time is a little different, right, in, in terms of services? So we could just have an Africa service today, and, like, who knows when it's going to be over. We've got the choir all <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, we got to hear more about that, Jewel. Man, she posted some pictures. Whew, awesome. So it's different, right? Now, anybody, uh, I know Bernard and, and, and Margaret and Laura and I, we served in a Chinese church for a number of years. And what do you, what's the worship style like? Uh, what's worship like in a Chinese church? Well, nobody knows. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, so instead of, you know, like, you know, four on the floor, it's... You know, uh, anyway, I, I can't really mimic that. But it's always off if you're Eastern or Western, you know, depending on, on that. And uh, it tends to be reserved. You don't hear a whole lot of amening and shouting. And what tends to happen is there's a very judgmental kind of spirit that tends to creep in there, right? And so, it, you know, if you're going to apply for a position in a black church, they might judge you on how loud you are. And if you're going to apply at a position for a Chinese church, which I've been a part of twice... Uh, you know, I was kind of like the nail that needed to get hammered down quite often. <laughs> and I needed to get hammered down, by the way. <laughs> but, but some of that just preferential stuff, it's just different. And so as a multi-ethnic church, this is going to be something that's very pertinent to us. There's no right or better worship style. There's no right way to dress or cultural preference. In the church, the gospel way is we die to our preferences. We give our best for the sake of others. So if you don't like what's going on, either help us to change it or just don't complain about it because it's not here for you. Like it's here for you, but there's a community of people out there that aren't in here yet. There, there are a community of people that are just lost and broken and we're trying to reach them and whatever we can do to change our music and blend it and, and just add to it and bring more flavor and more diversity, quite frankly, I don't care what it sounds like. I mean, I have my preferences. I want to I wanna choir. I want to be doing this right here, you know, quite frankly, you know. I want a whole percussion section and, and, and horns and all of that, you know. That's my preference. I am very comfortable in a black church. But this isn't a black church. So this is going to be a black and white and Asian and mixed ethnicities and multi-ethnic. And we're going to have to figure out what that's going to look like as it just evolves. Right? And we're going to struggle with it. We better move on because that's just point one. <laughs> Peter failed to live in line with the gospel and we all struggle too. Now notice how the Apostle Paul confronted him. 
verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line. So where do we get this idea? It, it's right here, right? When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, who's Peter, in front of everybody, <laughs> you are a Jew and yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? That's not the gospel. And then he just lays into it. We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, ouch, <laughs> Know that a person is not justified. In other words, they're not made right. They're not made acceptable to God. Justification is the way in which we are made acceptable to God. Are we, are we made acceptable to God based on what we do or don't do or what? Paul says, a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified, made right, acceptable by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. I think he's trying to make the point pretty clear here. I love Tim Keller's paraphrase of this passage. Listen to this. God did not have fellowship with you on the basis of your race and culture. Though you were good and devout, a good and devout Jew, your race and customs had nothing to do with it. Therefore, how can you have fellowship on the basis of race and culture? That's irrelevant. I love the fact that Paul didn't just confront and point out Peter's sin, although he did. But he appealed to Peter on the basis of grace. What an example of how to confront somebody's hypocrisy and legalism. I'm so grateful. Peter, Peter, you're not justified by what you're doing. <laughs> you're justified by faith, man. Remember you. You know, in other words, he's like, remember how you became acceptable to God. It wasn't because you were good. Yeah, you were a good and devout kind of guy. I'm not dissing you, man. Like, yeah, you had, that was good. But no one can be justified by it. It's the grace of God, Peter. So he appeals to his, how he was made acceptable to God, and yet directly confronts his sin. I love, again, how grace is just a better motivator. Grace is just a better motivator than fear or guilt. It's a little easier to lean in with guilt and fear, but it's so much better to be motivated by grace. Again, Tim Keller said this, when we use God's grace as a motivator, we can criticize sharply and directly, but the other person will generally be able to perceive that we are nonetheless for them. I'm not attacking you. I'm trying to correct what I think is a works kind of thing. Like, let's talk about this on the basis of grace. If we are justified in God's eyes by faith alone, why would we ever feel the need to then be justified in the eyes of someone else? And yet it pulls us. I don't want to look like I'm not, you know, that I don't have it together. My friends, this is why we must soak our minds and our lives in the grace of God and in this grace-filled gospel. See, there is no such thing, and this could be a whole other series of messages, but there's no such thing, if this is true, if justification, which is how we are made acceptable to God, is by faith and not by works, then there's no such thing as an on-again, off-again relationship with God uh, or fellowship with God. In other words, there's nothing that you can do to like be on the side of where God's at. Or, or like, you know, it, like here's the presence of God and, and you sin and, you're, and now you're way over here. You know, there's no such thing. You, you are not made acceptable to God based on what you do. And Paul's going to get into this later in the book. He said, look, if you were saved by faith, you can't make yourself grow by any other way. He uses this word sanctification. Like if you're saved by grace through faith, you, you are sanctified in the same way. You can't become a Christian and put your faith in Jesus just and that purely be faith and then, and then add works to become a good Christian. It doesn't work that way. And there's no such thing. I remember these sisters that Annie and Laura and I went to school with from Brazil. 
and their dad. I remember meeting their dad at the graduation. And he was this godly man, pastor, missionary for many years. And uh, just, you know, kind of like Rod, a very distinguished kind of Brazilian, you know, Latin man. Who, and he's just spoken a way, you know, similar to Pastor Rod, that you just want to listen. And he was that kind of, uh, it was Noemi and, uh, what's, what's her sister's name? Jackie, Jackie and Noemi. And, um, and I remember we're talking uh, over a meal, a graduation or whatever, and I said something about some, being a strong Christian. I was talking about someone else. And he, I remember he grabbed my arm and he said, oh, Ed, I can't say, you know, say it in the same way. There's no such thing as a strong Christian. There's only a Christian who's, I don't remember exactly what he said, but basically like this. There's only a Christian who's been justified and made right by God, by God's grace, and they only are what they are by the grace of God. They're really not that strong. <laughs> I love that. Thinking that we must add something to Jesus slips us into legalism and we forget that Jesus truly is enough. Now let's get into the YBH, yes but how, of living in line with this amazing gospel of grace. Verse 17, but if in seeking to be justified by Christ or in Christ, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, anyone who is justified by faith still sins. Are we going to be found among the sinners? Yes, because we are them. And we're all Gentiles too. I mean, unless anyone's a Jew in here. Uh, and if you are, you're in the same uh, sinful boat, but we're all in this category of what Paul, Paul says. So, we, we Jews find ourselves among the sinners. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. Now, these two verses are a bit obscure and difficult to understand, but I think verse 18 basically means that we do not have an excuse to just keep on sinning. Yes, we're justified by faith alone, grace alone, but that doesn't allow us the freedom, then we are free, but we're, we're not to use that freedom to just go do whatever we want to do. I, I, I like to say it like this, and we're going to see this in Galatians chapter 5 very clearly. Friends, you are free to do whatever you want to do, only you are not to use that freedom to do whatever you want to do. And Paul clearly states in chapter 5, use your freedom to love. That's what you're set free to do. You're not set free to just do whatever you want to do, but you are. And you have that choice. And you can go do whatever you want to do. But Paul says, don't do that though. Use that freedom to love. The old man died. If I just keep living the same way, with the same sins, without repentance, it shows, not necessarily that I'm not a believer anymore, or that I wasn't really a believer, but it shows that I never really understood the gospel. I never really got the grace of God. I was just looking for an excuse to keep sinning. In other words, if I'm forgiven completely, and teens in our youth group you would say this over and over again, if I'm forgiven completely, then why not just keep on sinning, because it's fun. Since God already sees me as righteous, then whatever I do, he's not going to see me as unrighteous, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. But don't do that. Because you're just missing the grace of God. You're missing the whole point of why Jesus went to the cross. He didn't just go to the cross so that you could go to heaven when you die. He went to the cross so you could experience grace today and tomorrow and over and over and over again. God's grace just doesn't give us a free pass on sin. God's grace is really the fuel for living a gospelized life. So notice how Paul goes on to give Peter and us the real YBH, the how to live in line with the gospel as we close. How to live in line with the gospel. Verse 19, for though the law, I'm sorry, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Verse 21, this is so important. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. So there's a little bit of a tension here. How do we live in line with the gospel? Well, on one hand, we die to self-salvation. There is nothing that I can do to gain God's acceptance. I can't be good enough. 
I can't get better enough. I can't be strong enough. I can't get it right enough this week to be more acceptable to God. The only way to live for God is to die to self-salvation and totally trust in what Jesus has done. Completely by grace through faith in Jesus. And then remember our true identity. So this is where like, I really would like a list of five things to do. But that's not going to be the application here today. Because the one thing to do is to soak in your true identity. In verse 20, uh, uh, there's a tension here, right? On one hand, Paul says, I no longer live. But then he says, the life I now live. (laughs) Hmm. There's a tension. In verse 20, Paul restates the point. Live in line with the gospel. Our true identity is in Christ. In fact, in another place, soon after Paul writes Galatians, he writes Colossians to a different church, and he says in verse 3-3 of Colossians, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So yes, there is truly a death and there is a new identity, but there's a tension because we live in this flesh. And we don't always feel Like the old person has died. Like sometimes the old Ed is alive and kicking. And the old you is alive and kicking on some days too, right? Uh, Verse 21, again, I love Tim Keller's paraphrase. I think it's helpful. Now when I live my life and make my choices and do my work, I do so remembering who I am by faith in Christ who loved me so much. When I go to work tomorrow and I teach those kids, or I go to that office, or I go to the computer, or I go to that meeting, or I go to whatever I'm doing, what does it mean to do that in line with the gospel? Well, I remember that I go in there as a child of the king, as a deeply, deeply loved individual, and God wants that love to be experienced by those people that I'm working with. And that's, that's what I'm free to do now. Chapter 5, now I'm free to love those people that are my co-workers. So notice this last phrase here in verse 21. If righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. So here it is. Jesus is everything or he's nothing. Either salvation, my whole hope is totally in him alone, or I can, I can get there a little bit. It's, it's all or nothing. If we could save ourselves, then his sacrifice and death mean nothing. But since it means everything, we can spend the rest of our lives responding to this grace that is overflowing and overflowing and overflowing. We can respond to that in loving obedience. How do we live out this gospelized life? We do it one day at a time in loving obedience. Not, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't obey to be a good Christian. There's no such thing that doesn't exist. The only kind of obedience that that God loves is when it's loving obedience simply because I'm loved. Simply because He loves me. Anyway, this. Let's wrap it up. We all get out of line when it comes to living the gospel on a day to day basis, right? Number two, we gather to encourage and admonish one another to get back in line with the gospel. We need regular reminders that we are justified before God by faith alone. And we can live in line with the gospel by dying to self-salvation and living in light of our true identity. So let's soak in the gospel. This is going to be a little bit different here as we close. Let's soak in the revelation that you are more deeply loved. When you walked in here, you didn't understand the measure of God's love for you in the way that he wants you. And I didn't either. And so let's soak in it. We're going to take a minute. In fact, God's love, I shared this last week, God's love, I think the best picture I ever heard of it was Niagara Falls. And you're like at the bottom of Niagara Falls and his love is like that falls just coming at you, just coming at you. It just, you can't stop it. You, You can't hold it back. There's no end to it. So I want you to take one minute. Hopefully we're going to play this video just for one minute and I want you to consider God's love for you pouring out like this just put the distractions away and let's see if we can do that
So that wasn't crystal clear. But I want to encourage you to take this metaphor with you today. And take some time and find, there are some videos that you can find that it's just the sound for like two hours. And just put it on. You come home stressed at night, stressed after work one day. You get into some tense conflict. You're just feeling out of line and out of whack with the gospel. Throw on a YouTube video that's just the sound of Niagara Falls for 10 minutes. And just say, God, I need you to love me. And I'm going to sit here until I secure your love as the center of my life. And just try that and see what difference that can make this week. And I want to I challenge you like I did last week to read this passage. It, just even these last couple of verses, verses 19 and 20. And, and ask this question this week. Am I living in line with the gospel? And this isn't like meant for uh, guilt. Like, I'm not assuming, oh, no, I'm not, you know, I'm terrible. No, that, that would be the antithesis of this message. Just, am I living in line with the gospel? Am I soaking my life? And allow that to motivate you to, to, to receive. Because it's only the person who's been filled up with the love and grace of God that has the love and grace of God to give others. And that's what, that's the aim here. Now, I met a brother months ago who shared a secret struggle, a, a difficult one. And we become close friends. And last week I got a text in an intense struggle. And I hope that as a church, we receive more of these kind of texts and calls and, and, and stopovers, in, 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 knocks on our door uh, that we're struggling. And uh, this brother asked to prayer and, and we shared scripture and, and prayed. And, and by, a great, by the grace of God, he was able to stay strong and keep in line with the gospel. Isn't that beautiful? By God's grace, he was able to die to self-salvation and live in line with his true identity. And may that be the story of all of us as we go out this week. That praise God, by the grace of God, we're able to live in line a little bit more. It's not about, a, uh, it's not about the destination, it's about the direction. The direction of my life is in line with the gospel. So as you wrestle with the gospel this week, listen to what he is saying to you. If he reveals an area that's not in line, turn from it. And share your experience like this brother did with me last week. It was so freeing and, and I, was, I was so encouraged. There's something incredibly freeing about confession and repentance in community. So let's bow and we'll close in prayer. We're going to sing a song as we... Uh...